Hey everyone, higher running coach and Hoka athlete Sage Kande here with another training talk, episode number 63, I believe. Thank you so much for all your support on here and the comments from last week's or last talk. Um, I, there was a top voted question on Norwegian style training or double threshold training. I shouldn't just say Nor Norwegian style, maybe made more popular by the Inge Britsons, um, but something that uh, elite East African runners do. We're not going to talk about that today yet. We're going to talk about a related topic though of zone two training, aerobic base building. Uh, it's gotten a lot of buzz, in, especially in the last several years on social media. I think more coaches and more maybe influencers, exercise science people have realized uh, you know, it's thrown around a lot of buzzwords, aerobic base building, and something that's not new. It's not new. It's something I've been preaching about on here for over a decade. If you look at all my aerobic base building videos, you know, run slow to get fast type of idea. And in this video, I really want to break it down and defining it as well as see the common pitfalls and the misinformation I've seen spread out there by some influencer athlete coaches, maybe, uh, who have maybe twisted the definition around and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong too. Comment below uh, with the debate, so to speak. But this is the way that I see it uh, as an elite athlete and as a running coach. And as in terms of thinking of it in terms of numbers and scientific metrics, but also in terms of perceived effort exertion, how you feel, how it may relate to your marathon road race pace or some standard 5K pace or something like that. Uh, and what it means in terms of implications for your training to maximize your health and your athletic performance at any surface, any distance. So let's get started. So as I said, a lot of buzz on social media with this. I actually uh, sent out a tweet earlier today. I take the screenshot there about zone two training. And, you know, people have talked over the years, moth method, right, is like this new concept. It's not new. It's not new. Exercise science guys, I know, of, you know, there's a lot of science. There's data and data of decades and decades of data, uh, you know, supporting aerobic development for in all endurance athletes, not just distance runners, but, you know, triathletes, cyclists. Uh, I come from the running background, so I'm just going to talk about it in terms of running because the mechanics are different if you're talking about non-impact sports like skiing, cross-country skiing, or cycling, or swimming, or triathlon where you're mixing multiple sport disciplines and movement patterns. But the heart and lungs don't know the difference of what you're doing, and the, the aerobic system is very, very efficient in the human body. So if we go back even farther in time, give credit where credit is due, uh, I think Arthur Lydiard was preaching a lot of this aerobic based development in his training philosophy back in the 1960s, coaching Olympic marathon runners and 5K runners and other distance runners, 800 meter, um, because he's talking about periodization of training or how your training changes over time. But a big part of it was doing marathon style type of base training, more marathon, long distance, uh, I don't want to say long, slow distance because we're always doing some pace changes, but, uh, you know, steady state efforts, types of up-tempo, tempo runs, looking at the different thresholds, but then a lot of high mileage base building. And the high mileage part is a really big key to this. I think people now, that's the first misconception, is they think I need to go out and walk or jog as slow as possible, and I'm just worried about my heart rate all the time, and, uh, you know, that'll be it. But if you're only doing 20 miles a week, 32K a week, and you're training for a marathon, you're not, your weekly mileage isn't even the same as the race distance, right? Um, a lot of people, you're, they're gonna get a lot more benefit if you could increase your weekly mileage or increase your weekly volume, and how you do that is through slower running generally. But the whole point with the zone two training, and let's try to define it here scientifically. If you search on the internet, on the interwebs, can't believe everything you see or hear or read on the interwebs, including maybe some stuff in this video, <laughs> is that people have different definitions of what zone two really is, right? Some people, you look at, they're like, it's 80% of your max heart rate, which in my mind is approaching uh, more like zone three, more like getting into the threshold realms, right? Other people be like, oh no, it's got, you gotta go as slow as possible, you gotta be walking, it's like 55% of your max heart rate. Uh, I would consider that zone one, to tell you the truth. So other people like, oh, there's only a three zone, they only have a three zone system. Well, I'm talking about a five zone system. So we got zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four, zone five, right? Zone five, think like all out, anaerobic, lactic acid, puking on the track, really high intensity, 
Um, and then zone three, zone four, you're looking at the thresholds uh, from, oh, I'll get into this at the end of the talk, but ventilatory threshold, aerobic threshold into lactate threshold, anaerobic contribution after the, the lactate threshold inflection point. I don't want to get too sciencey on this talk, but we're talking about easy, mostly easy conversational pace running with zone two in my mind. And in my mind, that is more like uh, you could go down to 60% max heart rate maybe, but 65 to 75% of your max heart rate. If you were talking about max heart rate, relative percentage of your 100% max. Now, the problem with that is there is a lot of heart rate monitor error out there, especially these days. You cannot trust, uh, especially a lot of wrist strap monitors, in my experience, across the board. Depending on the person, depending on the tightness of the watch, the weather conditions, that thing could be way off. It could be on, it could be on too, but you, you gotta, unless you have a real heart rate strap on your chest, like a EKG machine, even the chest straps, which are generally more accurate, could be very inaccurate. So take your readings of the heart rate data with a grain of salt, because if we have bad data from the heart rates, this throws the whole heart rate percentages out, out of whack, right? It's, it's out of the equation. Likewise, a lot of people, and this is my theory, is it's very hard to actually pull out a true 100% maximum heart rate value. And I've done other talks on this with the VO2 max testing. You really need an incremental VO2 max test, test in a lab or a very, very hard, you know, hill repeat effort. There are some protocols you could do to try to max out your heart rate, but just because you ran hard for a minute up a hill and you were breathing really hard, hands on knees, and you felt like you were going all out, doesn't mean you even hit over 95% of your max heart rate. You could have flooded yourself with lactate before you got up. So it's a very incremental test, VO2 max test, very specific protocol with a ramp usually. And so if you don't know your 100% max heart rate, don't rely on that. Don't rely on a formula like 220 minus your age because that could be terribly inaccurate as well. I've seen tons of genetic differences with heart rate, max heart rate values. And usually it does trend down with age. It's a moving target as you get older. But for some people, genetically, it's just totally different. Some person 20 years older than me could have a max heart rate of 200, for example, whereas mine's on the lower side compared to most people. Probably my max could be, uh, I haven't even had it tested recently, uh, 175. It used to be in the 180s, but I'm getting older, so it's going down. Uh, anyway, I digress there. Heart rate is the first one that people look at. Now, if you're a road marathon runner, especially an experienced road marathon runner or half marathon or 5K runner, you know your PR pace on a flat surface in good weather conditions. Let's say you've run about a 303 marathon, that's seven flat per mile pace. Seven minutes per mile pace is your marathon pace. You finished in 303, that's about 421 per kilometer pace, I believe. Now, that's your all out marathon race pace. You've dialed it down. What would your zone two pace be then? What would be an easy day? Well, you could go out the door pretty close to marathon pace maybe, but it would be a significant effort. That's harder than zone two in my book. For a lot of people, it's at least a minute per mile slower than their marathon pace. And for more elites, uh, for me and, and guys that have run like under 220, I'd say a lot of times we're running two minutes a mile slower than our marathon pace. Um, so there's a range and that's a key point is if we're going by pace for zone two on a flat road service, trail runners at altitude, you know, you got to throw this out in good weather conditions, no big headwinds. Um, they would be running theoretically maybe 815 to 845 per mile pace. And that, notice that range, uh, it's like five minute to 520, 530 per kilometer pace. That's for this 303 marathon runner. That's their zone two pace. Uh, if we were going by pace. So the pace, especially if you're a flat road track runner, you're not running at altitude up and down hills or techie trails or in the mud, it's actually a really good barometer to monitor your, your, your zone two type of effort intensity. You just do it by pace straight up on a track. Um, very cut and dry there, probably even better than trying to rely on, fault, uh, rely on faulty heart rate data, right? So the pace is another thing. Now, if you're a trail runner or you're more beginner runner, maybe you haven't run a good marathon PR in good weather conditions, haven't optimized that, uh, it might be harder to dial that in. And, you know, scientifically in the lab, we could look at different values. If you're getting an incremental running economy test or VO2 max test, they could prick you and look at blood lactate values. They'd be like, oh, you're at three millimoles, four millimoles uh, crossing over the threshold. Again, a lot really sciencey. I haven't even gotten 
the, I don't have a personal lactate a meter test yet, but the lactate values in terms of millimoles of lactate in your bloodstream at different intensities are gonna be very individual also. Um, so it's all relative to your own data, not someone else's. Some people at two millimoles, it might be close to their, to an aerobic threshold. Other people, it might be closer to three millimoles. So you don't know. And a lot of people aren't gonna have access to that lactate testing, especially with accurate lactate meters and the protocol involved with that. So where does that leave us? Well, the final testing, we look at uh, respiratory exchange ratio, got to have a mask on in a lab usually to get that tested accurately also. So we throw that out the window. What's the final thing? And this is the gold standard uh, that you want to learn because I think it's a very valuable learned skill is perceived effort, rate of perceived exertion, which, you know, could roughly correspond to percentage of max heart rate, percentage of VO2 max. Um, but it's something that you could go out the door. If it's windy out, bad weather conditions, you feel tired because you did a long run three days ago. Maybe your pace range is a lot slower on that day and you're just doing it by how you feel and mainly by your breathing rate, ventilatory uh, rate. So if you could carry on a conversation really well when you're running, you're probably still kind of in zone two, right? When we start struggling to have long sentences, sentences, I can't even talk, sentences streamed together um, and we're starting to kind of huff and puff and you're like, okay, maybe I'm crossing this aerobic threshold, this ventilatory threshold and I'm approaching zone three right? Uh, more up-tempo is what we like to call it at higher running. So there's that, the talk test, right? And realize any given day, this pace range, zone two, uh, it could vary quite a bit. It could vary. It could vary. Heart rate values also vary by the day. So you have to keep that in mind as well. But the general principle is we're spending a lot of time upping our mileage, aerobic base building around zone two. Maybe sometimes it's zone one. Maybe sometimes it's zone three. That could happen all in the course of one run, actually. You think of a lot of elite East African runners. They start off at their slow walk shuffle. They're going 10 minute a mile pace, but then at the end, they're going five minute per mile pace. Uh, but most of the time in between, they were going still slower than their marathon pace. So it was zone two overall. Uh, realize that that's okay to have that pace range and fluctuation, and it's going to change on the day, and all these factors are going to change it. But we spend time doing this because we're burning fat very efficiently as a fuel, and we're building up the body rather than breaking it down. We're not inducing high levels of lactic acid. We're keeping the lactate clearance uh, manageable. We're uh, minimizing skeletal muscular stress because we're going at a slower pace than marathon pace, so we're not getting all that pounding but we're still getting the heart rate up enough, we're getting the breathing rate up enough that we're stimulating uh, cellular, cellular adaptations. And again, I've preached about this a long time, mainly with like, you think of the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, uh, size and density of mitochondria, this, all the efficiencies that go into aerobic uh, development, uh, the capillary bed density, right? Better blood flow to the muscles, better oxygen <clears throat> usage. And it really comes down to building that and your efficiency or your running economy in a very progressive manner, especially especially when you could raise that average weekly mileage, average weekly volume. Of course, the icing on the cake is mixing in speed, always having some uh, really good speed development and then touching on VO2 max and tempo runs, lactate threshold and all that other stuff that I've talked about in a lot of talks also. So that was my final takeaway. Um, notice the pace ranges. We could look at all the science, but realize that heart rate maybe is not always the best way to go about things. And that if you're a road marathon runner, you're dialed in, pace really does matter in these things, as well as the talk test. Can you talk? Is it manageable? So that's how I see zone two training. Super important, should be probably most weeks, it's the bulk of your weekly mileage, the bulk of your training, depending on what phase you're in. And uh, again, credit to Arthur Lydiard, periodization, bringing this all together with aerobic base building. It's nothing new. It's just been talked about more on social media in the last couple of years. So I wanted to clarify that. I've been talking about these training talks, uh, these types of topics on my training talk on this channel for over 12 years now. Uh, so really, really appreciate all your support. Check out our Higher Running website. That's higherrunning.com. Coach Sandy and I sell training plans for any service, any distance. We have free res resources on there, like our aerobic base building plan, though. Um, there's that, but then there's also the pace intensity spectrum chart, free download. You could check it out. It kind of breaks down the whole five zone type of theory. We don't, we don't label it in zones. We label it in terms of workout intensity and perceived exertion as well as max heart rate, but realize in our training plans, a lot of times, especially the marathon road woods, we will touch on, you have to be 
around marathon pace or a minute per mile slower than marathon pace or you know it's all relative to your goal race pace for a marathon so check that out on there thank you so much for all your support really appreciate it the patreon supporters for making this channel possible as well as tyrell sponsor hoka keeping the dream alive more vlog updates coming your way product reviews stuff like that hope you're doing well and stay tuned for more vo2 max productions mm -hmm.